So, why are we here? I think we're here partly because of a quote that's attributed to Phil Greenspun, even though he's not even sure he said it. But if he didn't, he should have. <laughs> so, we've all seen something like this somewhere in our lives. We've all been through this experience. And we also know that any sufficiently useful C or Fortran program is sufficiently complicated. So we're here, you guys, you guys, we, we're all here to provide heavy lifting. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about how Scheme might do this kind of heavy lifting. Now, um, where's Dorai? Dorai's there, Olin's there, Matthias is there. We're the only four Scheme programmers in the world. So if you get the roof to collapse, we'll all shut up and go away. So something to think about for the organizers. Oh, has a Lisp interpreter in it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, I'm here to motivate how Scheme does this, but I know what you're really thinking at the back of your heads. I know you're thinking, yeah, sure, it does it, but so does it really work? Can anyone actually program in this stupid thing? So, I'm here to tell you first about what I call the swine, which is the piggy, stupid, yucky, crappy stuff that nobody wants to deal with, that we're willing to deal with. I'm going to tell you very briefly what we actually do to deal with it. So, we provide books, okay? We're geeks, so we provide books. Teach Yourself Scheme in Fixed Num Days is a wonderful book written by Dorai Sita Ram. It's meant for people who already know how to program in something like Heavens for Fan, Perl, or Python, and may just want to learn about Scheme. How to use Scheme is... Um, I shouldn't call it a cookbook because that might violate some O'Reilly copyright or something. But um, if you can't guess from what I just said what it is, ask your neighbor and they'll tell you what's probably in the book. Okay? So, we got extensive manuals, we got user support, we provide it all free of cost. But of course, you're not looking at Scheme as something you can read, you're looking at Scheme as something you can write and something you can run. So, we have implementations. We have a nice, quick textual shell, which is ideal for scripting. We have a rich module system that can put most of the module systems to shame. We have an object system that can put most object systems to shame. It's embeddable in applications. It does garbage collection, real garbage collection, across languages, including C and C++, and libraries for all of the stupid three- and four-letter acronyms. Okay? We've got a bunch of this stuff. And if you run it, it looks kind of like this. You know, nothing exciting, little textual thing. And you can actually write useful programs in it. For example, here's a one-liner that tells me how much size is being occupied by a directory. If you can't read the code, that's fine. Come and look at it later on. Or you might want to go and download a web page. I know we functional guys are not supposed to think about these things. We're a little, you know, on the heretic side. I'm not even sure Eric wants to admit we exist. So I can write another one-liner that goes off on the web, pulls out a page, and prints it on screen. Okay? We're perfectly cool with people doing things like that, believe it or not. Well, we give you more. We give you a programming environment, a real programming environment. It's fully portable between the Unix, the Macintosh, and Windows. And it's got a lot of support for special, special support for beginning schemers. It looks kind of like this. This is an editor. This is an interaction window. And you can actually go in and type an expression, and it'll come back and give you an answer right away in blue to distinguish input from output. Okay? Nice graphical real stuff. And there's even more. There is a type inference engine, okay? But I know Neil and I have traded email about uh, type inference. There's actually PhD theses to be written here, and not because we're wankers, okay? <laughs> There's actually some hard stuff to be done here, believe it or not. It graphically displays inferred types, and I'll show you very quickly what it looks like when you use it. The same program that was on the previous slide, I can say, go to type inference, and it comes back with something like this. I, in, I purposely inserted some bugs. Schemers never write buggy code, of course. But I purposely inserted some bugs, and some things are green to say, these primitives are OK. They will guaranteed never produce an error when you run them. These are red to say, they might produce an error. Maybe, maybe not. And it gives me a summary of all of the things that might produce errors. So let's take a look at this. I don't expect you can read the code, OK? I know it's kind of scrunched up. I'm just trying to give you a conceptual view of how this thing would work. I want to know why I get this primitive application in red. So I can go click on stream and say, show me the type of stream. There are no type annotations. Magically, it infers them. Okay? It comes back and says, it's a list of symbols. And hmm, where did that list come from? 
I can click and I get a little blue arrow, may not be completely evident from the back of the room, but it actually draws a blue arrow to say, this list over here came from up here. Well, where did that thing get values from? I can say, show me all the ancestors. Voila! I can get arrows starting from here, going up here, coming down here, going through here, and there's the recursion, okay? We can do that. But that's a lot of junk. I don't want to know where all the values came from. I only want to know where the buggy values came from. I want to impose a filter on this. I impose a filter and it says it came from here. And I can ask for the type of this expression and it gives me that it's a list of symbol, etc., etc., etc. Okay? You can, uh, you can traverse your program. You can interactively debug your program just like a web browser. It's a program browser with types, real types. Okay? We've also got a bunch of other code. We have a really cool web server. It kicks some pretty serious butt because we do dynamic content generation using continuations. We have XML and HTML transformations, which are pretty trivial in scheme, and I'll show you a brief example of that later. We can trivially build some really cool security policies. For example, I just ran a computer science conference for which I wrote all of the code in scheme using the scheme web server. I want to maybe give Olin the ability to review a paper, but I don't want him reviewing all of my papers. I only want him to touch that one paper. How do I hand... Yeah, and I didn't trust him either. Yeah, this, this, is, this is for real, right. So, I want to give Olin this right, but I don't want to do what conferences normally do, which is to say, okay, here's this great web form, but you're a sub-reviewer, I don't trust you, so I'm going to give you an ASCII form and then cut and paste everything that you say into my web form. That's stupid, man, that's like so 70s, okay? I can, on my web server, generate a use once URL. I hand it off to Olin, he uses it once, he enters the review, the next time he tries to use it, it says, sorry, you can't go back in there, okay? Now, I can implement that security policy with four extra characters of code. And they're not magical, okay? This is completely intuitive. The whole thing took about 200 lines. A complete conference manager kicks the butt of, of the start conference manager, which is implemented in something else. <laughs> it's fast as heck. It's fast as heck. Dynamic content is eight times the speed of Apache, 10 times depending upon which test runs you use. And we beat the heck out of fast CGI and a whole bunch of, we've beaten everything we've tried. We've tried per, and Bruce Lewis did some benchmarks as well. We've beaten everything we've tried, okay? It's fast as heck. And it's, I'm sorry? Apache Mark Pearl as well. Yeah, good. So, that's the swine stuff, okay? That's the ugly stuff. That's the stuff that you really want to hear, and that's why it's at the front of the talk. But, but now you can all go to sleep, basically, okay? But, you know, the reason I use Scheme is not only because it's fast. It's not only because it's, you know, got continuations. It's not only because it's got, you know, libraries to do my XML work and my web processing. I use it because it's beautiful, okay? And I know that may not be something that everyone cares about, and that's really okay. But to me, it matters. And I want to give you an idea of what this beauty might be that's hidden deep in the language. Now, most of you know about closures and continuations. We've heard about them all day long. And that's easy stuff. That's like low-hanging fruit, okay? Anybody can give a talk about closures and continuations. These are like the crown jewels, and it's the stuff that everybody sees. I don't want to talk about that, okay? I want to talk about the stuff that some of you don't see, some of you see but think is really stupid, okay? But is actually really critical because all of these pieces fit together, and you pull out some of that stuff, and everything falls apart. Okay? So I want to talk about these three things. So I'll call them the lesser gems, if you will. Right? That's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. So I want to do this through an example. Now, I could give you, again, an example that uses continuations and all this other great stuff. We talked about the conference manager. Another example, I had a colleague who needed to debug a core dump. Um, he's out in Utah. I'm over at Brown, which is in Providence. Um, he doesn't have my architecture. It's a bit of a pain in my department to go around creating new accounts because of security policies. So here's what I did. I hacked up a little web server that basically takes his input, one line, runs it, takes the output, presents it back to him. He can take that output and generate the next query, the next query, and so on. So you get a nice interactive transcript on the web. But because it's on the web, he can now clone the window. Okay? He can use the back button. He can basically have two windows that show him two traversals through the GDB path. Okay? So it's a customized GDB shell. 
This whole thing took me 15 minutes to write. It actually took me 45 minutes to write because after doing the 15 minutes for GDB, it took me 30 minutes to factor the code out into the GDB specific part and the part that's not specific to GDB. So I can now write an interactive interface like this for any application. And it critically depends on the continuations. So I thought of doing that for this talk, but I said, you know, that's kind of low because that's like you're going to look at this and say, I don't know what a continuation is. This looks like magic. I'm not even sure I believe this works. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I am an academic geek, okay? So I'm going to give you a geeky academic example. I'm going to give you a simple, small, concise problem. It's so small that the code actually fits on my screen, right? I'm going to show you the code, and we'll talk through this, and I'll try to use this to motivate where this stuff really works. So. Here's the problem, okay? It's intentionally simple and academic. I want to build a pattern matcher for streams. So, I want to do, I want a stream, not, not just strings. I want to do this for streams. So it's going to consume a stream of input tokens. I want the code, the, the, the pattern matcher, to be easy to read and write. It must be fairly fast, okay? Fairly, you can use your own definition. And it must integrate well into the rest of the code, right? So I'm basically defining small finite state automata. I want to define a false, some small finite state automaton, and I want everybody who's writing a bigger application to be able to use my automaton to build something larger. It needs to integrate. I can't go around, like Olin said, I can't have a separate shell script that processes that and a separate shell script that processes this. Okay, there's my setup. So here's one example of an automaton. So if it's in state C0, it sees a 0, it goes to 1. If it's here, it sees a 1, it goes back to 0. Completely trivial, right? So in C0, if you see a 0, go to 1. If you see 1, go to 1, go to 0, right? So these are state names. They are the transitions. OK, here's a funkier example, OK? Some of the lispers will chuckle. So I have an init state. If I see the letter C, I go over to the more state. If I see an A or a D, I stay in the same state. If I see an R, I go into end, and I'll let you put as many R's at the end as you want, OK? Good. So I want a recognizer for a language like this. And so there's the automaton once again. Three states, this one has three transitions, they have one each. Just think about it for about 15 seconds, everyone. Don't blurt out any answers, just think about it. And Olin, shut up. <laughs> okay. This is not hard, right? This is not rocket science. I imagine most of your solutions look kind of like this. I'm going to have a vector of states, right? There's an init, there's a more, and there's an end. Attached to each is some table. So if I see C, I go to more. In more, if I see an A or a D, I go to more. If I see an R, I go to end. And likewise, an R. If the stream ends, I accept it. If there's no next state, I reject it. And if there's a next state found, I continue, right? Standard uh, dictionary implementation, for instance. Right, Jeremy? That'd be cool, right? OK, good random access, all that stuff. Right? I can use dictionaries, I can use association tables, hash tables, whatever you want. Okay. So I wrote the first version, and it took about 12 minutes, and I had two bugs, and I got it all out. And it's, you know, it's pretty fast here. I've got you know, however many. I've got one with lots of zeros elements, and it finishes in a small amount of time. So I'm pretty happy with it. And here's the code. I don't expect you to read it. It's just some big jumble of code. But now let's think about what the essence of the solution is. There are three things going on here. For every state, I want a fast conditional dispatch table, right? I'm in a state, and I see a C. I want to know which state to go to, fast conditional dispatches. I want some sort of array of states so I can get to the states quickly. And I want quick state transition, right? Those are the elements of a fast solution. Okay. Now, I want to pause for a moment for a message from our sponsors. Right? Some of you definitely recognize this quote. The rest of you should, because it's a very nice book that I took this quote out of. Now, I like this quote in particular because there's a very interesting word used there, virtue. Right? So let's think <laughs> virtuously. So let's go back and revisit these three criteria here. Okay. So per state fast conditional dispatch table, well, you know, what is a fast conditional dispatch table? It really depends. If I have, you know, a million states, right? If I have a million possible inputs and therefore a million next states, well, then maybe I want some sort of heavyweight hashing algorithm. 
If I have something smaller, maybe I want something smaller. If I have only two states, maybe it makes more sense to just do a sequential search rather than go through the extra cost of hashing on something, right? But this sounds like a really old problem. This sounds like stuff from the 60s, right? Compiler writers have done this for ages. It's called figuring out how to do a case switch statement. Okay, an array of states. So what's the essence of the array? The essence of the array is I want random access. Well, pointers give me random access. Function pointers in particular give me random access. And I want quick state transition. Well, you know, if I'm going to think of a function as representing a state, then a state transition becomes a function call. So, you know, if only function calls were implemented as go-tos, everything would be cool. But we know they're not, so we have to think about this harder. But let's think about what the code would look like. The init state would look like this, okay? It's a procedure, consumes a stream. If the stream, it's either the stream is empty, which is fine, otherwise they do a case switch on the first thing in the stream. If it's the symbol C, then I go to the state for more, right? Remember, every function has its own state. This is the state function for the state in it. If it's more, I go to the more state on the rest of the stream, otherwise they say it's false. I don't accept the string. Okay. And similarly for more, if it's empty, that's fine. Otherwise, I look at the first one. If it's A, D, or R, I do a dispatch. Otherwise, they say false. In particular, if it's more, I go back to these. If it's an A or a D, I go back to the same procedure. If it's an, a, if it's an R, I go to the end procedure. Okay? I just All I've done is code up the same thing that I said before. And similarly for the end state, so my overall code looks kind of like this. This is the first box I showed you. This is the second code I showed you. Similarly for the end, I put all of these in a little scope, right, a little scoping operator, and I, and I return the initial state in it, okay? So, notice that these function calls are a little funny, right? This call here calls this function. These two go back to the same function. N goes over here, N goes over here. So some of these calls are within the same function. Some of these calls are across functions, right? Okay. Now, some of you in the room know that I played a very nasty trick. What's the very nasty trick I've played? All the function calls are tail calls. They're not necessarily tail recursive, but they're tail calls, right? That, isn't, that means that when the function calls another function, control doesn't have to return because it doesn't do anything with the answer, right? That is, when I have gone to the state, to the next state, nothing needs to come back to me. I'm done, okay? Now, an intelligent scheme compiler, in fact, even a dumb scheme compiler, is required to turn every tail call into a go-to. Honest to goodness, go-to. Furthermore, okay, so it's not just tailed recursion, right? Because here there's recursion, here there's recursion, but these two arrows going down are not recursion. They're honest to goodness calls to a different function. So it's not just tailed recursion. Good. In fact, if you think about the code that is generated for this chunk of code up here, if you look at the code that gets generated in the machine, it's a finite state automaton. Okay? It's that same automaton that you were going to implement by hand by creating a vector, and you're going to draw a bunch of arrows and create a bunch of tables. My compiler already knows how to generate that for me, and I say, be my guest. Thank you. So, you got check on the laziness. But that's still an awful lot of code. I mean, you know, I don't really want to be writing that much code every time I want to find a state automaton. But there's actually a little bit of a pattern to the code. See? Every time I have a state that has a bunch of label target pairs, right? Here's the label, it goes to some target, and I say dot, dot, dot to mean there could be any number of these, right? I want to turn that into some very stylized code, right? The label goes over here, the target goes over here, and as many of these as I have over there, I have that many going down, right? Highly stylized code. There are the arrows showing where all the stuff goes. Okay. In fact, I can take this abstraction one level higher. This box, these are the two boxes, this is the stuff on the previous slide. I have any number of states. Well, I have a dot, dot, dot saying there's lots of states. I have a dot, dot, dot saying there's a lot of procedures. And whatever I designated as my initial state is what I return. So that procedure is what I return, and that's what I invoke to actually run the automaton. Now, here's the really annoying part. This isn't scheme code, right? 
I mean, I've just made up this random dot, dot, dot notation and made it sound, it's like somebody else's problem to go figure out how dot, dot, dot turns into actual, you know, code. Somebody has to figure out how many things there were, do the pattern matching, do the rewriting. So I haven't actually solved any problems. I have. That's actual scheme. Okay? Define syntax. I take the top box and put that here, the bottom box and put that here, and that's honest to goodness executable scheme. Okay? Scheme macro system is smart enough to figure out the dot dot dots. It's smart enough to say, I can have three things over here, and well, the first one has one, and the second one has four, and the third one has five, and I still need to expand them all out just right. Okay? Scheme macro system does that for me. So, here's the automaton that I wanted to write. Okay? I wanted to say there's an initial state, and these are all of the, all of the transitions. Here's the actual code that I do write. Okay? And as Jeremy sort of pointed out in his talk, once you get used to Scheme, Scheme's really an indentation-based language. A schema really looks at this and really sees something more like that. Really. You, don't, you may not believe me, but that's really the truth. So I can furthermore embed this in any other system that I want to build. For example, I can say, depending on the first thing I see, I either use this automaton or this automaton. This is just an expression. I can stick it in the middle of any other code I want. Right? It's just a function. Furthermore, I could create a vector of these. And that's how I could create a scanner table. Right? And I get my compiler to do all the hard work. So the second version takes five minutes, no bugs, and you know it's 40% faster. Now, there's actually a lie on the slide. The lie is. That wasn't my second version. That was my first version. I went back and wrote the second version to figure out how to get, how to, you know, do the stuff by hand, and that's how I introduced the bugs. Okay? Maybe that's just a sign of how warped I am. We'll take it as that. So we got the second thing down. So what really happened here? The traditional, in, the traditional implementation with tables and association lists and everything else. That's really an interpreter for a really small language of finite state automata. What the macro does is it's a compiler that takes some extended scheme. It's the same idea that Olin talked about this morning. Take some extended scheme and turns it into a regular scheme. It lets you reuse the existing scheme compiler that you've already got. So macros, getting back to those three gems, the lesser gems, they're clean, convenient specs. They permit these nested pattern matching kinds of specifications. I suspect you can do the same thing with Perl pattern matching as well. They easy, make it easy to create domain-specific languages. And the beauty is in PLT scheme, which is the scheme system that my group, Matthias, and a bunch of other people here, anyone who's got these nasty Lambda-looking logos is part of this group, so stay away from them. Okay? In our system, each module can be written in a different domain-specific language. Right? So I can encapsulate these macros instead of pervading my entire system. This was a question that somebody asked Olin. Instead of pervading my entire system, I can say this module is in this domain-specific language. That one's in that domain-specific language. The traffic between the modules are real scheme values, lists, closures, continuations. Within the module, I use a restricted language, so I cur curtail the scope of this weird syntax. Second gem, tail calls. Right. It's more than tail recursion. It's tail calls that ensure that the loops I get for free, right? And oh yeah, if you know, if you have loops in your language but no tail calls, try generating this code. It's kind of fun. Third gem, stupid parenthetical syntax. Okay, <laughs> this is obviously a dumb, stupid, evil plot. This, on the other hand. <laughs> So I went over to the Python website and found this great comparison of Python to Scheme. Okay? And I'm going to offer a comparison between Python and our Scheme system. Okay? Why do I can make this distinction in all schemes and our Scheme? Because Scheme is a language of diversity. Okay? Every implementer is free to go off and do what they want. It defines a small core subset of the intellectually interesting ideas, the gems, and then says, you figure out how you want to do I.O. for the systems that you want to support. So comparing Python and Scheme isn't even that interesting to me because I don't program in Scheme. I program in PLT Scheme. Okay? So, standard object system. We got that. Regular expressions, internet connectivity. I even showed you an example at the beginning. Many built-in data types. Check. 
one standard implementation. Well, you could argue whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. We have one standard implementation, which is misscheme. We also now have a scheme to C compiler. If you really, you know, speed is what you crave, we got that too. Okay? Relatively mainstream syntax, we don't have that. But I have to ask, at what price? And finally, mainstream controlled structures, I have two things to say. We've got macros. You got five minutes? Okay? Because for me, not only a for loop is a controlled structure, automaton is a controlled structure. Awk is a controlled structure. They're all controlled structures. I got the primitives. I can build the controlled structures I want. I can put them away in a library, and I don't need to worry about it again. Furthermore, you know, if you think you're a real programmer, use real con controlled structures anyway, right? <laughs> this is what I call a loop. So, a few take-home morals from this talk. Sorry, I'm missing the joke. Sorry. OK. So if you take home morals, if you claim to be smart, be really, really smart about reuse. Don't just reuse simple things. Have, go build yourself a real compiler. Trust your compiler. Reuse the compiler. OK? Second, scheme fits together in very subtle and clever ways. I say this not because I'm a scheme, design, a scheme implementer, but because I came to scheme as a user. I came to scheme from a world like Pascal. And it took me years to understand exactly what was beautiful about this. You can look at a book, but you won't get a feel for it. It's a particularly insidious language because it hides its jewels. We're writing books to try to solve that problem, but the jewels are still hidden. You need to get into its guts to really understand why this language matters. Now, it may be you don't want to actually program in it after all that, but you should at least understand it to understand the jewels in it. Third. People who don't understand this use of tail calls just don't get what tail calls really are. Okay? So if, you, if you're a little confused by this, think about this. It's not tail recursion, it's tail calls. And finally, Mike and Greg, where, Mike and Greg said I should say provocative things. So here's my final provocative comment, especially those of you who are still students. Go take a real languages course in college. <laughs> I have one last. I'm not quite done. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You might not be so thrilled when I'm done. So I'm going to give you just a quick parting thought here, OK? So in Scheme, we're really proud of the fact we have this thing called the redevelop plinth loop, right? That's the little interaction loop that I showed you at the beginning, right? Type an expression, get an answer right away. So it's called a REPL because it reads, then it evaluates, it prints, and then loops all over again. But really, if you write this as code, you'd really write this as like a print eval read loop. Right? It's a print eval read loop. So, if you have questions, happy to take them. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a recent sort of scheme convert, but I think is there not an extent to which uh, the power to express things like that in the scheme uh, is just as dangerous at all as, say, Perl or C templates or macros? If these C macros, one of these, like, uh, sort of too much rope. Uh, that, that need to be yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Now, this is one of the big, uh, let me give you a co concrete instantiation of that problem, right? One of the long debates that has pervaded the scheme community is do we need all of continuations, right? It's clearly a bit of a rope. Maybe if we just had exceptions and we just had threads, we'd get almost everything. In fact, it's true. If you just have exceptions, you just have threads, you get almost every single thing you can do with continuations. The problem is, the problem is, and this is the thing that just bites at the bottom of all this, is it keeps you from discovering new things. See, when we came to web programming, if all we had was threads and all we had was exceptions, I wouldn't have been able to build the scheme server to be as good as it is. I wouldn't have been able to write that little interactive script or the, the conference manager in you know one afternoon. I wouldn't have been able to. I needed the full power of continuations. Okay, And Paul Graham can sort of validate that, I think, too. Okay. Well, Paul Graham has this great article. I think you've sold a company right, right now, right? So you don't mind people hearing all about your successes. Yeah. And he has these great articles on his homepage that explain how they were able to kick butt because they had the competitive edge of not, of, you know, being smart, right? So, yeah, these things are nasty, but at the same time, they let you build great things. And, you know, 
I think in the end, you know, that you can't make, you can't keep programmers from doing stupid things, right? We all know that. So the least I can do is try to help them do smart things. These guys want to help them do smart things too, right? We just slightly disagree. We don't completely disagree. We don't disagree all that much, right? I just want to let them do even more smart things um, in even more interesting ways. And you know, we might well end up converging in a while. Yes. Um, you had one uh, sort of sideline in, in one of your comments about. Uh, the syntax at what price? Yeah. So other languages, the non-parenthetical syntax brings this this great overhead or something. At least that was the suggestion. What would you say that that price is? What what's the big cost? Well, sort of getting macros, really getting macros right. I've seen every proposal I know of on non on macros for non non-parenthetical languages. Okay, and I've never seen one that I actually thought worked. I've never actually seen anyone build anything convincing with one. Okay. Now, actually, let me just say that I think macros, yes. sir. Oh no! Please. Oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> that, like, of all, I, I think that's the worst example you could have given because. No, it's not. Yeah. Have you seen X uh, You mean this is the one from Ohio State? Uh, Iton Gorari's thing? No. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I don't have hygiene. I don't. Yeah. But why would you want to? Yeah, it's a look. At the, at this point, tech is essentially. At this, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The problem with tech is the tech macros are not really sort of macros. They're really functions. Okay, they're kind of this funny mix between functions and macros. I'm using macros to specifically say a static layer that completes before program execution begins. That is not what tech macros are. Okay, a true preprocessor. Yeah. I think, in fact, that the parenthetical syntax is one of the great ideas of computer science, right? Because if you take, you know, the normal problem of parsing is it's this huge, nasty problem, and I don't even understand how the hell one builds a parser, but it's like I know there are textbooks that explain things that I don't understand, okay? Whereas if I look at the problem of parsing something like Scheme, I break it into two sub problems a read part and a parse part. And you know what? A reader takes about, you know, what? About 10, 11 lines of code. The last one I wrote took 11 lines of code. And a parser takes about, you know, two lines per construct in Scheme, that's another 10 lines of code, right? So I reduce this thousand line problem into two 10 line problems. I think that's great computer science. That's real heavy lifting for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is, yeah. There was a hand up here. Yeah, Victor. Yeah, I was just wondering what you think about MetaML as Fexpers. It's Fexpers. They're not real macros. So. Meta ML is an attempt to put macros into ML. Meta ML is not quite running yet. When it will be running, it will be Fexpers and not macros. Yeah. So, so in fact, I know they're trying to fix it, but when they actually fix it and produce a running implementation, well, I'd be happy to tell it. But it's like a macro system in, in the uh, static type world with a conventional syntax. It's called a new parallel definitional syntax. Yeah. That's yeah. the only proposal that ever worked. Yeah. On this thing. Sir, question. So, yeah. This is the last uh, one. One of the running yeah. themes today has been that these ideas don't trickle out to the larger programming community. And I'm just curious, are you guys ever going to get your stuff onto a Linux distribution or, you know? You know, oh, okay, good question. So we do put out Linux RPMs. We've been, okay, hold on. We've been trying to get it on a Linux distribution. We contacted Red Hat several times. And Red Hat distributes some totally third-rate scheme system out there that nobody maintains and hasn't maintained in a decade. We can't get Red Hat to actually put this on a darn CD. Okay? If anyone's listening out there, we can't get you to put it on a darn CD. Okay? Debian has adopted it. I believe it's at least a package or whatever Debian notion is if it's not part of the distribution. We're trying. Okay? We, if users actually write in and tell them, that'd be great. Who? Mandrake? Okay. Yeah. There is also Guile, the... Uh, version of scheme that's embedded in the GIMP. I mean, there's uh, part of the thing is it gets used behind the scenes in places where it doesn't get. OK, one last question, Neil. Okay. Last one, absolutely last one. OK, one uh, totally impractical question. Sure, go ahead. Last time I talked to, a, to an ML programmer um, who was smarter than me, he objected to my liking macros because he said high order functions can do everything macros can. Ah, that's that's exactly why I gave this example. This example does not work with higher order functions. Um, and yeah. Actually, this was the example I used, and yeah. he said, and once you have all these higher order functions, you should trust your inliner and partial evaluator to optimize it into this into this form. The uh, the automaton. Yeah. Yes. The, the ML programmer will then have used lambda, and it's a pattern lambda. Excuse me, fun. Fun everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And they, did you see a single lambda in his code? 
No, See, the point is, I can is give this automaton point? to a random user, right? I can give it to somebody who doesn't want to touch Scheme. I can give it to them without saying, you, you don't have to worry. This is the only syntax you will see, <coughs> right? There's no unquote in there either. Guy Steele said, what if you put an unquote now, you sort of expose the whole world? I purposely didn't put an unquote in there. It's statically compilable, statically optimizable, right? You don't get that power. So, there you go. End of sermon. Thank you very much.